deprivation experiment. And in this experiment, subjects were randomly assigned to the sleep deprivation and the unrestricted sleep treatment. All right, so some people were told you can sleep as much as you want, and other people only got a little bit of sleep. Uh, random assignment we've talked about helps ensure that the two groups of subjects are as alike as possible before the treatments are imposed. In other words, it doesn't eliminate the fact that like maybe some people are just better sleepers than others, right? Or whatever other confounding effects there are. It evens them out between the group, hopefully. That's the plan with random assignment, okay? Um, so if the unrestricted sleep group performs much better than the um, sleep deprivation group and the difference is too large to be explained by chance variation in the random assignment, it must be due to the treatments. In that case, the scientists could safely conclude that sleep deprivation caused the increase in performance. That is, they could make an inference about cause and effect. So what do you have to have in order to have cause and effect? And you have to have random assignment, all right? So you have to say, you are going to get sleep. You are not going to get sleep. You're going to get sleep. You're not going to get sleep, right? By some sort of method, like the hat method, or the screen the D, or random inches, all right? Um, one problem, though, with this experiment, we did do random assignment. However, because the experiment used volunteer subjects, this limits scientists' ability to generalize their findings to some larger population of individuals. In other words, we can say cause and effect, but only to the people who did the study, all right? Not to the larger population. So because they were volunteer subjects, we're not sure if it's the same thing. So we need people, we actually need to be able to choose randomly from a group of people as well. So we have random selection of individuals, that allows inference about the population, and I would write this down. All right, so random selection allows inference about the population. So I can generalize to the larger whole. So let's say I'm talking about Devlin, and I'm able to randomly select 20 students and maybe do the sleep deprivation study. All right, then I can generalize to all of Devlin. And then random assignment, so I don't let them choose who gets sleep, who doesn't get sleep, or I don't just observe who got sleep and who didn't get sleep, right? They get randomly assigned. Then I can have some sort of cause and effect, okay? Random assignment leads us to cause and effect. Random selection allows inference about the population. So this is the same thing. Were individuals randomly assigned to groups? All right, random assignment. So if they're randomly assigned to groups, inference about the population, yes. Inference about the population, no. All right? So it's the same thing as saying this. They just have it four different ways because it's all combinations, whether we have both those things happening or both those things not happening. All right, were the individuals randomly selected? So if I have yes and yes, both things are happening, then I have inference about the population and I have inference about cause and effect, right? If both things are happening, we get yes and yes. If both things are not happening, so I didn't randomly assign and I didn't randomly select, then we can't have inference about the population or cause and effect, all right? It's the same thing as what you wrote down here, hopefully, okay? But there can be any combination of those things happening. Um, so let's talk about every single possible design, all right, all four combinations, whether we randomly select or assign. Um, determining scope of inference, vitamin C and canker scores. A small town dentist wants to know if a daily dose of 500 milligrams of vitamin C will result in fewer canker scores in the mouth than taking no vitamin C. So here's our following studies. One method. We're going to get all the dental patients in town with app uh, appointments in the next two weeks. So we're just taking people who have appointments in the next two weeks to take part in the study. So if I just take people who have appointments in the next two weeks, is that random selection? No. Okay. 
give each patient a survey with two questions. Do you take at least 500 milligrams of vitamin C each day? Do you frequently have canker sores? So they're just asking, right? Based on patient's answers to question one, divide them into two groups, those who take at least 500 milligrams of vitamin C a day and those who don't. So did they randomly assign? No, they just ask them, do you take vitamin C or do you not? And then they're gonna like look at the results. So do we have either of those things, random selection or random assignment? Nope, so can we make any kind of cause and effect or can we generalize to the larger population? Nope, <laughs> okay. All right, so that's probably not a good design. So here's another one. Get all dental patients in town with appointments in the next two weeks. So did we have random selection? Nope, because it's the same as this one. All right, just taking the people in the next two weeks. Randomly assign half of them to take 500 milligrams of vitamin C each day and the other half to abstain from taking vitamin C for three months. So do we have random assignment on this one? Yeah, we're saying you're taking vitamin C, you're not. You're taking vitamin C, you're not, right? So we didn't have random selection, we do have random assignment, so can we generalize to the larger population? No. Can we have cause and effect? Yes. All right. And so it would only be cause and effect amongst that group of people. We can't say, oh, amongst every dental patient. Okay? How about design number three? Select a random sample of dental patients in town and get them to take part in a study. Divide the patients into two groups as in design one as in just ask them if they take vitamin C or not, okay? So do we have random selection? Yes. It says we randomly select a sample from people in town, all right? And so can we generalize to the larger population? Yep, all right, do we have cause and effect? Nope, because we didn't assign them whether who was taking uh, vitamin C or not, all right? So of course this last one's gonna be the best one. Select a random sample of dental patients in town and get them to take part in a study, randomly assign half of them to take 500 milligrams of vitamin C um, each day and the other half to abstain from taking vitamin C for the next three months. So we have both and we can generalize to the whole town then and we can say vitamin C caused or didn't cause more canker sores or whatever, okay? Um, that's the conclusion which we already talked about. All right, the challenges of establishing causation. So a well-designed experiment tells us that changes in the explanatory variable cause changes in the response variable. More precisely, it tells us that this happens for specific individuals in the specific environment of this specific experiment. So another threat that we can talk about um, is that the treatments, the subjects, or the environment of our experiment may not be realistic. So there's something called a lack of realism, which you might want to write down, which can limit our ability to apply the conclusions of an experiment to the settings of greatest interest. So here's an example of lack of realism. Do center brake lights reduce rear end crashes? So do those high center brake lights required on all cars sold in the United States since 1986 really reduce rear end collision? So randomize comparative experiments with fleets of rental cars and business cars done before the lights were required showed that the third brake light, so the one in the middle, besides the two bumpers, reduced rear end collisions by as much as 50%. But requiring the third light in all cars led to only a 5% drop when they actually did it. So why would that be? Uh, what happened? Most cars did not have the extra brake light when the experiments were carried out. So it ended up catching the eye of the drivers, right? 
But once every single car had the third light, it was like the norm, and so it no longer captured people's attention. Does that make sense? So it's just called a lack of realism. It's not actually the third brake light. It's the fact that something was different about the car in the back that made the people stop faster or whatever. Okay? I just thought. Um, so ethical, what's ethical? Uh, we kind of talked about this the other day. In some cases, it isn't practical or even ethical to do an experiment. Consider these important questions. Does texting while driving increase the risk of having an accident? Does going to church regularly help people live longer? Does smoking cause lung cancer? Um, so to answer these cause and effect questions, should we tell someone to text and drive? Should we tell someone to smoke? Should we tell someone to go to church? All right, not really. We can't really do that. So since we can't randomly assign people to text while driving or attend church or smoke cigarettes, the best data we have about these and many other cause and effect questions come from observational studies. All right. Now, sometimes, very rarely, it is possible to build a strong case for causation even if you don't have an experiment. All right. The evidence that smoking causes lung cancer is about as strong as non-experimental evidence can possibly be. So no, we've never told some people to smoke and some people not to smoke because we certainly don't want someone to just get lung cancer because we forced them to smoke. But there's so much evidence that just watching people smoke that has led to uh, lung cancer that we can almost say, yeah, there's cause and effect. Okay. Um, so basically, if you compare smokers and similar non-smokers, there's a very strong association between smoking, death, from lung cancer. Could the association be due to some other variable? Is there some genetic factor that makes people both more likely to get addicted to nicotine and develop lung cancer? If so, um, then smoking and lung cancer would be strongly associated, even if smoking had no direct effect on the lungs. Or maybe confounding is to blame. It might be that smokers live unhealthy lives in other ways, like diet, alcohol, or lack of exercise, and that some other habit confounded with smoking is the cause of lung cancer. So how did they overcome confounding or other objections? So how can we go ahead and say there's causation? Uh, the association is strong. So the association between smoking and lung cancer is very strong. Uh, the association is consistent. So many studies of different kinds of people in many countries link smoking to lung cancer. That reduces the chance that some other variable specific to one group or one study explains the association. Larger values of the explanatory variable are associated with stronger responses. So people who smoke more cigarettes per day or smoke over a longer period of their life get lung cancer more often. Um, the alleged cause precedes the effect in time. So lung cancer develops after years of smoking. The number of men dying of lung cancer rose as smoking became more common with a lag of about 30 years. Lung cancer kills more men than any other form of cancer. Lung cancer was rare among women until women began to smoke. Lung cancer in women rose along with smoking, again with a lag of about 30 years, and has now passed breast cancer as the leading cause of cancer death among women. So cause is plausible, all right? We can actually say cause and effect is plausible. They also have done experiments with animals to show that parts from cigarettes smoke do cause cancer. That's kind of sad. Just a couple things about ethics. Um, if you're going to do a study, uh, they have to be reviewed in advance by an institutional, institutional review board, which protects the safety and well-being of the subject. All individuals who are subjects in a study must give their informed consent before the data are collected. And all, all individual data must be kept confidential. So only like groups of things are made public, not individual data. 